Thank you for keeping it KTN Farmers TV. I'm Philip Keitan, and this is This Week in Agriculture. On today's show, I'm joined by Shadrach Agaki. Welcome to the show, Shadrach. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Uh, I am a master's student at the University of Nairobi. Uh, I've been writing extensively on, on agriculture and food security because I think it is, uh, is the basic foundation of any prosperity in any nation. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Shadrach. Um, I also want to thank you for coming to the show. Thank you. And I'm sure our viewers will really benefit from the insights we'll have uh, today. Maybe we start by looking at our, our first story of the, the first story of the day. A section of farmers and leaders from the North Rift region have expressed fears of maize importation after the state agency delayed opening its doors for the purchase of last year's season produce. According to the groups, the move by the National Cereals and Produce Board NCPB to close its doors for maize purchase will create a leeway for unscrupulous traders to import the grain and sell it to the state agency at exorbitant prices, hurting the already ailing sector. In previous years, the NCPB used to open its doors at around October up to January, but it's a new planting season. It's now January, and the NCPB has not opened its doors. Maybe just to get a clear picture from farmers, what we lazy jinsi mambo elivio, tunawa diko kufikia sasa NCPB haije fungua milango yake. Wengine wanasema kwamba wenda serikali inanjamba fiche ya kuimport maindi. Binafsi yako unasema aji? Eh, kwa majina, kwa majina naitua Ronald Koski, mini mkaji wa wasingishu. Na kwa, kwa maneno ya maindi, Sisi kama wakulima tunawofia kwamba e, serikali na njama fije wanataka kutoa maindi kutoka inji sa inje. Kwa sababu tumefata fununu ya kwamba mwezi wa tatu wanataka kutoa maindi kutoka inji sa inje. Na wamesema ya kwamba maindi iliaripiwa na mfua. Ilali tukona maindi ya kutosha katika mjuhu wa wasingishu. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Kerich. I'm from Nandi. I'm a former councillor from Nandi and I'm a farmer from Nandi. I'm surprised for the first time in the history of this country. The National Cereals and Produce Board has not opened its stores. It is surprising and it is very unfortunate and it is a very bad, it is a very bad uh, impression by the government. You know, we, wonder, we had earlier on said the leadership of any country should be caring about the farmers of the country. What, I, uh, what we are witnessing now is something Instead of the national, the government opening its stores last year, by October, November, December, it is very, very surprising and unfortunate that they are opening at the time they are supposed to be closing the cereals board. The national cereals and produce board are supposed to be closing their doors next month, which is February. So when are the gov is the government going to open its stores? It is not willing to open because it is, it is a deliberate move. They want to create a deficit in this country so that they will bring the import, they will import the maize. Uh, my name is uh, Meto Ezekiel. Yes, yes, Meto. I'm also a farmer from Nandi North, mm -hmm. in particular myself. Yes. Uh, we have had challenges uh, since uh, NCBB has not opened its stores. Mm -hmm. Right now we are sending our, school, our children to schools. We have had to sell maize to middlemen. Children are not going the right way because uh, what we are getting from the middlemen is not enough. What is the government doing? We hear of referendums. We hear people speaking that they want to go for a referendum. Where is money for the referendum when there is no money for buying maize? This is very unfair. I want to tell our president, if you really love your people, stop pushing your ambitions. Pursue your the ambitions of the Kenyan citizens who are more than an individual. Thank you. Shadrach, what is your opinion on this particular topic? I think for me, uh the government need to reconsider their position and they need to act fast so that to alleviate the, the pain of the farmers. Because I know the farmers invest so much uh, to produce this type of food, which is maize. And uh, if the government doesn't uh, help the farmers to take this produce, then it discourages them, and which I think is not good for, uh, for, for, the, for the country in terms of food security, yes. So uh, I think the government and the Ministry of Agriculture must, uh, must look at this and then act swiftly to, to help the farmers. And uh, I think they also need to uh, 
consult with the, the leaders, the political leaders, the opinion leaders in the uh, maize planting areas, so that they can find a way of uh, uh, coming to a solution so that the farmers could benefit from their effort. Okay. As you've also uh, seen from the, 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 the piece itself, uh, some of these uh, farmers and leaders are complaining that uh, this delay will also open doors for uh, middlemen and unscrupulous traders to buy the maize from the farmers at cheaper cost and then sell it again to the NCPB when they open. Do you think there is a way that um, the government, I remember last year we had the same issue, do you think there is a way the government now can um, make sure that that one doesn't happen? Yes, I think there is. Uh, because they say where there is a will, always a way is found. So for me, uh, I look at the government or the Ministry of Agriculture and the government at large uh, make a, making a decision to, number one, do the research. Because uh, there needs to be uh, research, inquiring what, what do we have? And then when we find out what we have, they can decide then what is the amount that we can set aside for this, uh, for, for this uh, buyout of the produce? Because I think if we look at the sec uh, food security situation in the country, we are not yet there. And we are sure that going forward in the next few months, we will start hearing, oh, you know, we don't have enough, enough uh, maize produce. Why don't the government uh, find out a way? Because I know with the, the kind of wealth that we have in this country, uh, the government will have uh, enough resources to buy the, this produce from the farmers. Also, you remember last year, uh, the same staple crop, not just last year, but even the other years, we've had something called aflatoxin. And remember this year, as, this is January and it's raining. What are your expectations? Do you think we may end up even losing more maize uh, to aflatoxin if farmers will not be able to dry their maize well? Yeah, that's a problem. You know, we have a, a problem with food loss uh, and it's a major problem. And for me, uh, this is called for now the institutions like Carillo to come in and educate farmers. Because the most important thing will be education. Do we educate our farmers or on what they are supposed to do in terms of uh, keeping their, uh, or storing their, their produce? Because that's where it comes from. As we wind up on, on this particular topic, the new season is coming up. And you know, over the years, the government has been providing subsidies to the farmers. Last year, the government did not provide fertilizer and there was a lot of uh, cry from the farmers. Do you think, um, the farmers were, were right to complain that they didn't get subsidies, especially the fertilizer subsidies. Of course, yes. I think they, they had, they, they had a, uh, you know, they had a right to, uh, to ask for that and to complain about it. Because number one, I know, uh, you know, we are taxpayers, farmers are taxpayers, they pay money and they expect some services from, uh, from, um, from the government. And let's remember we are a developing country and, uh, it, the government plays a very important role in terms of uh, helping uh, the farmers and the citizens in terms of production. Uh, so the government, for real, and if we look at it and the reasons why they didn't provide that, you say uh, they had a right to, uh, the farmers had a right. Because number one, not that the government didn't have money, there was money, but the processes that were supposed to be undertaken for the uh, fertilizer to be released were late. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Shadrach. I think that would be a good point to, 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 leave, uh, to leave that particular topic. I know this topic, we will continue talking about it until um, early May, after the farmers have grown their crop. But in the meantime, let's look at another topic here, a, a very hot topic. The government has ditch shooting in the air to scare locusts that have ravaged North, northern Kenya for aerial spray. This is according to government spokesperson retired Colonel Cyrus Odiambo Oguna, who added that they have acquired 3,000 liters of chemicals for the exercise to curb the insect invasion. The government also acquired aerial spray capa capabilities 
The spring has already started. Swarms of desert locusts invaded Wajir, Marsabit, and Mandera counties from neighboring Somalia a week ago. In July last year, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization warned that the desert locust was likely to invade Kenya by the end of December in the absence of urgent interventions. Despite pleas from leaders from the region for urgent action, the government had remained mum even as the locusts continue to wreak havoc on the vegetation. It now appears that help is finally coming. Maneno ya locust ni maneno ya region. Na the headquarters ziko kure Ethiopia. Na coordination yote inavanyika Ethiopia. The government spokesman says ground local support monitoring teams have been dispatched to the affected counties to deal with the situation. 3,000 liters of chemicals to kill the locusts have been dispatched. The spraying will start today. The aircraft will be positioned in Wajia from where all the affected counties shall be sprayed. Additionally, distribution of handheld sprayers together with protective gears have also been done to the counties of Masabit, Wajia, and Isiolo. The locusts are highly mobile and are able to fly 150 kilometers in a day. A female locust lays about 300 eggs in her lifespan. The locusts have a voracious appetite, and a sum of about 80 million locusts can consume food in one day, equivalent to 10 elephants. Since good rains fell over a large part of the Oganen region in Ethiopia and Western Somalia, Many swamps are expected to remain in place, mature and lay eggs from late January for another generation of breeding that will cause a dramatic increase in locusts, threatening crops and pasture. Even spraying locusts is a scientific kind of procedure. So they have to settle. When they settle, then they will be spread there and then they will be able to be contained there. We are also monitoring the neighboring counties of, of uh, Masabit, Garissa and Isiolo. Lazima uangarie. Uweke utafiti mzuri, ufanye surveillance, ili ujue mahali zinaenda kulala, ni wapi zinataka kutegea mayai, ili tuweza kupabana nazo. The Food and Agriculture Organization says locusts have damaged about 70,000 hectares, which is equivalent to 150,000 acres of farmland in Somalia and neighboring eastern Ethiopia. The president has been fully briefed of the situation and he directed that urgent measures be undertaken to deal with the situation as quickly as possible. Residents will be keenly monitoring the government efforts to kill the mature locusts and control further breeding. Shadrach, what is your opinion on the desert locust and the invasion in northern Kenya? That's not something new. Uh, you know, uh, if you look at the reports, it started somewhere in uh, July of 2019. We had this uh, uh, warning that they were to come. And, uh, you know, you know these, are, these are challenges that we have. And uh, in terms of solving them, uh, it has reached Kenya and the reaction by the government, of course, is okay we need to do better because if we had the information that this will happen in Kenya mm -hmm. at the end of 2019 now it has come early 2020 and uh, FAO gave that warning in July uh, 2019 I mean and we are told the the locusts have already destroyed uh, a substantial uh, amount of vegetation in the north uh, not Eastern. I mean, we should uh, we should be prepared enough to, uh, to 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 act on such incidents when they happen mm -hmm. by taking precautions. Talking about taking precautions, this is the second time the government has been found has been caught flat-footed. Remember, uh, also early late 2017, early 2018, the invasion of the fall armyworm. The government had already been warned but they didn't take precautionary measures until the army worm arrived. Do you think the government is really um, proactive in, in, with such things? I think we, we need to blame ourselves. That's, 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 that's my honest opinion, because it goes back to the values that we have had. Okay? 
because the values that we have sometimes reflect on the leaders that we choose and that reflect on the system that we have. So uh, the challenges that we have been having, uh, we, can, we can say the government has been reactive and that's not the best way to, to handle national issues. You know, we are not talking about the locust only, we are talking about the floods. We are talking about so many other issue, nas, nas, national issues. And uh, to solve that, I, I think we need to start now uh, uh, building our values in a different way. And when I talk about values, I start looking at how do we handle things even within the, the villages. And then from there, we move up and then look at the national issues and how we, we plan to uh, like solve the issues and challenges that we, we have. Not just waiting until they happen, then we react to them. Okay. Let me, if I take you back to the locust uh, story. Um, it's a regional thing. Um, I don't know how so uh, Somalia handled it, or they just let the, uh, the, the, the locust fly over. But if you look at the way we handled it, uh, the first time we saw our soldiers being used to, to shoot in there, I don't know how helpful that was. I also saw another sh soldier was using a whistle to blow, was blowing a whistle, walking around, hoping it will... Is there... Because I'm sure this is not the first time locusts have invaded a region. What did the other countries or those previous uh, times, how did they use to, to eliminate such uh, pests and disease? I, I think, I think uh, uh, Philip, we are Africans and we understand there are traditional ways of doing things. I think... But using a fair, gun is not traditional. <laughs> yeah, to be fair to the people of Northeastern, they were trying to salvage a situation that was affecting them because the government was taking uh, the long before they come. Uh, so I, I'm imagining because when I was growing up in the village, there are those things that we used to do. So I think in a small scale, in a small scale, what they did was trying to help and sometimes it can work in a small scale. But in the large scale, it cannot work. It needs uh, uh, more, uh, you know, more to be done. And you say this is a regional and, in fact, is an international issue. It's, it's an international issue. Look, this locust started from, uh, from Iran. And uh, what the Iran government did is to spray. It's aerial spray like we have uh, finally come to do. Shadrach, I think we'll leave that topic at that hoping that the government will be able to find uh, better solutions to deal with them. But in, um, in the meantime, we can uh, go ahead and look at another topic here. A farmer in Moisbridge Town, Transoia County, is counting losses after his sheep were attacked at his yard and killed by a suspected wild animal. Joseph Meli, who runs a butchery in Moisbridge Town, says the wild animal killed 12 of his sheep, which he estimated at around 120,000 shillings. County KWS warden John Garia Mwakima said the suspect, they suspect the sheep might have been killed by wild dogs, but they have initiated investigations to establish the kind of wild animals that was involved in the incident. Mwaka jana pia kama saa kumi Mnyama kama hii ilikuja na ikaweza kuua kondo ya mkulima mwingine tena sita. Chuzi chuzi tumesikia huko siwa pia kulikuwa na mnyama kama hiyo. Tumesikia tena chuo kali kulikuwa na mnyama kama hiyo. 
So nataka kuambia tribute eh, county commission ya kwamba haingilia hii maneno na watu waambie ukweli ni nini ambaye inaumisa wakulima nini inakula wanyama eh, wanyama ya wakulima ile ambayo inaweza kuwa suspect ambayo imeua hiyo wanyama ni kama wild dog kwa mfano hivi tuko na wanyama ambayo ni wild dog alafu tuko na sabocat na leopard lakini ile tunaona kabisa kabisa ile imeua ni wild dog so ile tukipenda kuhimiza na nchi ukipata wanyama wameuawa kwa boma lako ni ensure usiinterfere na sim wacha mali mnyama ameuawa waache iwe vile vile iwe vile vile kwa sababu naona hii mkulima amejaribu kufunga kabisa amefunga ni mabati vizuri na ni pole kwake in the last few weeks we've seen um, an increase um, in cases whereby livestock have been killed by wild animals ranging starting from Kajiado, Nyeri, now in, uh, as far as Wasingishu County. I don't know what the problem is. H how comes uh, at this moment in time we are seeing an increase in uh, human-wildlife conflict? What do you think the, 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 the problem is? My honest opinion would be uh, we have different, uh, different factors that will be contributing to that. Number one, we will have uh, management of our wildlife system as I can say a major, uh, a major factor contributing to that. And then we have uh, uh, development of infrastructure as another, uh, another, another factor that may be contributing to this. Because number one, we know all our wildlife are within uh, secluded places. That's the, the parks. And uh, we know the, the Kenya Wildlife uh, Service should be knowing where are certain animals and where are the openings where they can, uh, they can get out from. So I think it's a management issue. Number two, uh, like I said, is the infrastructure development. We have the, the, the railway, the standard gauge railway, which has been passing through uh, uh, parks. And uh, this could also be uh, contributing to the uh, br breaking of fences where they, uh, the, the animals get out and then they go uh, uh, affecting the farmers. We've also had uh, issues of the same people have been affected by the human wildlife conflict, complaining that they need to be compensated. Do you think they have a right to, to demand for compensation? Yes, I, I think they, 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 they have. Uh, but that depends on, uh, just like you said, you know, we have said it's a management issue. If you encroached uh, where the animals are supposed to be and you, uh, your animals have been eaten, then I don't think the government has a, reliability, uh, a responsibility to compensate you. But where the animals have gotten out of the parks due to the uh, problem of the management of the, uh, the Kenya Wildlife Service, the government is, has a responsibility to compensate those who have been affected. Just last year, the government did a census and you saw the population uh, numbers have grown up or, or have increased. Do you think with this increase in population, uh, does it also give, um, uh, become a risk to these wild animals? Because the population is increasing, people need more space. Do you think we will start pushing even the, the wild animals more out of their uh, habitat? When you talk about that, then we look at uh, the benefit. Uh, you know, we do the cost benefit analysis of uh, such instances. We have an increasing population, yes, we are around now 47, uh, we're heading to 50. And then we have the wild animals. The, uh, the, the cost-benefit uh, analysis then will be, what is, what is it that we are benefiting from the, the wild animal? It's tourism, okay? And then, do we have a responsibility of, uh, you know, conserving that so that we can continue uh, getting more tourists to come and visit our, our country, mm -hmm. or 
do we want to expand uh, our territories to the animal farms or to the parks uh, to cater for our, uh, our needs? I honestly think uh, we don't need to do that. What we only need to do in terms, because as, we in, uh, as the population increase, we also need to figure out how to increase uh, whatever that we are producing that takes care of uh, our human needs. And uh, of course that goes back to, uh, you know, uh, job creation, uh, improvement in uh, agricultural production. Uh, you know, we have extensive land that is not used. Look at the Northeastern. Why is it that we can't, we can't find a way of uh, utilizing the vast arid and semi-arid land that we have in Kenya, which is not utilized, to produce food? Israel is a desert, but they produce food and they export food. Thank you very much, Shadrach. I'm sure our viewers have really benefited from this conversation. Uh, for our viewers who are watching at home, uh, we will be back shortly, but for, for those who are joining us now, you can still follow us on our social media platforms. But in the meantime, don't change that dial.